based on my stage play, which was done at the Abbey Theater and um, on a tour in Canada. How exciting. Wow. Very. Until I saw. Yeah, we've been tapping into our Irish networks. Oh. Kim has a review coming out in the Irish Times in a couple of weeks. So we're hoping to do more. We'll do some radio and podcasts in Ireland, given the lockdown over there and here. <laughs> review of what, Lisa? Her book. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, great. Well, of course they should. Yeah. Um, is Ireland locked down now? I haven't they've been, in with they've been terribly locked down, you know, really, they can't go out anywhere. And they can only, you know, if they have to go somewhere, they can only go four kilometers from their home. It's really been very drastic, which, you know, of course, they don't have 546,000 dead like we do. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, a friend of mine had a pandemic baby. So she's taking I just see pictures of her outside with the, her daughter. So it doesn't look like lockdown, but. That's in Ireland, your friend. Yeah, she's outside of Dublin. Yeah, maybe it's harder outside, easier outside in Dublin, they're quite locked down. And they know restaurants or bars or anything are open. Um, I know Paris is, is totally they don't let the cafes open and the bars. So my friend there said Paris is very triste. <laughs> Can you tell me something about this China US women's organization? Yes, um, I'd be happy to, uh, we are gonna get started probably in like two minutes. I think we'll be joined by probably like five more people. Um, and then I'll, I'll say a few words, but we are a platform for communications between China and the US for women to help them to thrive. Um, and I, have, I have a particular interest, Leslie. I um, produce an epic movie, uh, which was a co-production between Canada and China, and it had a uh, heroine was uh, the, the, a big star in China. So, mm -hmm. so interesting to me that you have this organization. Yes, we started it about three years ago, and it really has been kind of riding the wave of history. You know, first there was a lot of contact, then there were growing tensions, and then the pandemic. Now there's the rise of anti-Asian violence, coupled with um, kind of rising communication between China and the U.S. again. So we're hopeful, but we're also... Um, you know, of course, saddened by um, the rising violence. Mm. I'm just going to refill my water glass. Okay. Yes, we have a lot of that violence also in Canada. Okay. And uh, I want to um, uh, address it through this film of mine, which tells how crucial the Chinese were in holding our country together in building the railroad. This is a film with Peter O'Toole and Sam Neill and Sun Li, who is a marvelous Chinese woman. What's the name of the film? Iron Road. Iron Road. Oh, yeah, the website is ironroadthemovie.com. Well, maybe we can uh, showcase it. I mean, wonderful to um, take a look and we can talk about it. That's yes, Leslie, afterwards, maybe you could give me your email. Okay. Hi, can anybody hear me? Yes, yes. Patrick, yes. Okay, good. I could hear everybody else. I was just wondering if I was an invisible mute person. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I think we can uh, slowly get started. Um, 
I want to welcome everyone to uh, the China US Women's Foundation Zoom session. Um, we are celebrating a happy occasion today, which is the uh, launch of Kim Ben Time's uh, new book. Uh, as a friend of Kim's, I've uh, been um, amazed by her consistency and diligence. She has through the years talked about Maud Gunn, been interested in it, and then uh, in the last two years said, I'm going to write a book about it. And a lot of people say, I'm going to write a book. And then 10 years later, they're still talking about uh, that book. And of course, here we are together celebrating that Kim's uh, book has been published. So we um, are happy about that and congratulations, Kim. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to say um, it is with heavy heart that we mourn the murders of eight people, six of whom were women of Asian descent in Atlanta last Tuesday, and the murders of 10 people in Boulder, Colorado. Um, we decry the increasing violence against Asian American communities. More than 3,800 reports of anti-Asian incidents have been reported with a 150% spike in anti-Asian crime since the COVID pandemic. We believe this is the latest wake up call um, against gun violence and that we need to collectively push for stricter gun laws. Uh, the China US Women's Foundation was founded uh -huh. three years ago as a platform to encourage dialogue and uh, mutual support between women in China and the US. Um, we are committed to uh, open dialogue. We think women have a lot to say and that by hearing women's voices, there's so much that can be contributed to uh, improving the world for everyone. And we are uh, devoted to that cause. Um, so today, um, I'd like to welcome uh, Kim Bentheim, um, who is a journalist, a writer, um, uh, who has written about a variety of topics. Today, we're gonna to talk about Maud Gunn. Um, with me as well is Lisa Faith Phillips. Uh, Lisa is uh, one of the uh, co-founders of the China US Women's Foundation, and she's in charge of social media mm -hmm. and outreach. Uh, she also has an illustrious career in publishing. She was a uh, senior vice president at Random House for over 10 years. So um, Lisa is going to be conducting the interview, and then um, afterwards, we'll open mm -hmm. it up for a general discussion. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I wanted to start by showing the beautiful book uh, that has come out now. You can get the ebook, of course, but the charming cover of the book. We've really loved the designer's work on this. So that's the charming book. And we do have a discount from the publisher today. I put it in chat. You can save 15% off uh, if you click through to the publisher or books and you'll see the link there and you can buy either the paperback or the ebook. So I'm thrilled to be with Kim today. I've been so admiring, as Leslie said, about how Kim talked about doing this book and two years later she had the book. It's really been very, very admirable. Um, I was fascinated to learn more about Maud Gunn. I think like a lot of people, I thought of her just as the muse for the great Irish poet W.B. Yeats. But as you read the book and you learn her many, many fascinating achievements from journalism to activism to being an early media influencer, uh, you'll be riveted as well. Just to give a little history setting, Maud was born in 1866 and died in 1953. So she lived through some incredibly changing decades. So welcome, Kim, our author today who we're celebrating, perfect for uh, St. Patrick's Day and also Women's History Month. I wanted to start with a question for Kim. We'll do some questions and with Kim and then I'll you know, do a little interview with Kim and then we'll open for general questions from everyone. Kim, how did you get so interested in Maud Gunn that you wanted to write a book? Um, well, I was, I did my thesis, my undergraduate thesis on the Irish playwright J.M. Singh. So I had an interest in Irish literature. And then when I lived in LA, I wrote a, a book review for a monthly LA Irish uh, publication and I reviewed uh, 
Maud Gunn's letters between her and Yates, which was published for the first time and ed edited by her granddaughter who grew up in the same house as her and by a noted scholar. And I thought it was amazing. And that uh, piqued my interest. Yeah, fascinating that you were so, you know, interested that you continued to explore, you know, her work and, and do such a great book. Um, why do you think Maud Gunn fascinated and mesmerized so many people through her life? Um, she was very tall. Neither of her great granddaughters could confirm that she was six feet tall, but she was as tall as, as Yates. Um, and her physically imposing presence, her voice, and then what she had to say combined to make her mesmerizing. I was intrigued to find out in your book that her grandfather, when he died in 1869, had you know, left over 200 million equivalent dollars today, and his, her mother inherited $27 million. So she inherited a great deal of money when her mother passed away. But at the time, women didn't have a lot of control, especially married women, over their own money. How did she manage that great fortune? Well, um, it just before, I think it was like in 1860 that women were allowed to own property in their own name in England apart from their husbands. So it was very new. Mm. Uh, but she managed to, I don't know how she managed her money, but I know that she supported three generations of her family. <laughs> and um, I think also money gave her a certain confidence to approach men. She approached uh, Frenchmen who she was involved with for 16 years first. And um, according to her husband, she proposed to him first. She also gave him money, like a dowry. So that's unusual. That is. She had an unconventional upbringing. Could you tell us about her relationship with her great aunt, the Countess Ciceron? Uh, um, sorry, uh, the Countess Cicerain was uh, a resplendent older woman with huge white hair that she'd do up in a Marie Antoinette uh, like <laughs> mass. And it was all her hair, which Maud found out when her lady's maid wasn't there to help her arrange it. Uh, and she had a secretary, who was nominally a secretary, but was really her lover. And he was much younger. And when Maud visited her in Paris, um, and I think she was, she was a teenager. The countess took her out and bought her a new hat, showed her how important it was to pick the right perfume, the right clothes. And her great aunt emphasized that beauty for women was essential and that it involved work, um, which is an idea that both Maud and her sister Kathleen accepted. Uh, and that Yeats letter, later wove into a poem. Mm -hmm. Interesting. How did Maud who, Maud, who was born in England, become so passionate about Ireland and Irish resistance and Irish human rights? Well, she was state, her father was a captain in the British army who was posted all over the empire. And he was posted to Ireland after the failed Finian uprising. And so Maud grew up with Irish kids and played with them because uh, her mother died when she was only five and her father parked her and her sister in a little fishing village outside of Dublin. And there she grew up scrambling around the cliffs and playing with the Irish Catholic kids and her nurse who was her nanny uh, healed, you know, nursed a lot of the locals. So they all had a fond feeling for Maud and her nurse, even though they were English. Ah, that's a good way to have a, a early bond with the Irish. Now Maud is remembered as being amused to the great Irish poet W.B. Yeats and you captured his words, how he described when he first met her. Would you wanna read those for us? 
sure. But I have to say one other thing that okay. Maude, um, she lost her mother at five. And even as an old woman, when she was being interviewed for on the radio and they asked about why she identified so much with the Irish, she said it was because the Irish, she thought of Ireland as a mother Mm -hmm. And she wanted to defend the mother and protect all these children who were being abused under the British Empire, like evictions and starvation and famine, to name a few things. Um, but this is the passage of what Yeats wrote in his memoir. And um, he said, I was 23 years old when the troubling of my life began. As I look backward, it seems to me that she brought into my life, for as yet I saw only what lay upon the surface, the middle of a tint, a sound as of a barmy's gong, an overpowering tumult that had yet many pleasant secondary notes. I had never thought to see in a living woman so great a beauty. It belonged to famous pictures, to poetry, to some legendary past a complexion like apple blossoms through which the light falls by a great heap of such blossoms in the window and a stature so great that she seemed of a divine race. Wow, that's a nice thing to write about somebody. <laughs> well, he fell in love, he was great, <laughs> that was it. Well, I really enjoyed how you also wove your own feelings through the book. What made you decide to do that? Um, my editor wanted me to make it personal. Mm -hmm. And I also had a writing coach who provided me with much needed weekly deadlines. And she also thought I, I could draw parallels between my life and Maud's. Oh, interesting. It really works. Now, Maud had a very unconventional love life, which I found riveting, especially for her times. Would you tell us about her re early relationship with her French lover? Sure. Um, when she was, her, her mother died of tuberculosis, as, as did her grandparents, and she was thought to be tubercular, and in those days they had health uh, cures, like go to a destination or to a spa, so Maud went to the spa with her great aunt, the elegant Countess de Cizeraine, and her sister Kathleen, and while she was at this spa, she noticed this handsome Frenchman with a great waxed mustache and <laughs> he was also six feet tall. And she began talking to him first. She said, do I know you? And he said, no, but I would like you to. Um, and he was 16 years older, a pretty, a very well-known political right-wing French correspondent. And they had an affair that lasted for 13 years. And um, he was already married, oops. <laughs> and um, he had a son by that wife, but you know, he was French and in French these relationships, if handled discreetly, happened all the time. So she was his woman in Paris. Hmm. Amazing. And he was a great influence on her, wasn't he, for her political life? Yes, because as a young woman, she thought she wanted to be an actress. And when and she'd had some success, she'd been cast. You know, she, as I said, she had this great voice and this great physical presence. Um, but when she was talking to Lucien Milvois, he said, why waste your talents on the stage when you could become a heroine for all time that you could become the Irish uh, Joan of Arc liberating Ireland from the English as Joan of Arc liberated uh, from the English, liberated the French from the English. Mm -hmm. uh, and she thought that sounded like uh, a good idea because she'd already been taken when she went to hunting balls, she'd seen evicted people on the way and she was already very uh, upset and caught by their plight. Mm. That's interesting. Now you, you pointed out in the book that uh, 
her the one or one of the past Irish biographies of Maud Gunn was entitled The Adulterous Muse and how that belittles her, which is is shocking. Um, but do you find there's other she did so many things through her life life. Do you feel there's other areas where she was sort of ignored and belittled in all of her activism? Yes. And I also want to point out no one's ever written a biography of Yeats and called it the adulterous poet. <laughs> His first affair was also with a, mar <laughs> a married older person. Oh. Um, <coughs> she did a lot of work for um, Maud for the Amnesty Associations on the behalf of Irish political prisoners for whom Britain introduced their draconian treason laws that you could arrest and hold people without trial. Mm -hmm. And Maud was always the voice of these political prisoners. And she talked and lectured about them in France, in the US, and in England. Sure. Uh, and she also did other things, which I consider very significant. She tried to feed Irish school children. Oh, and um, she was instrumental in getting England to pass its school lunch act to Ireland also, so that school lunches were provided at school for the kids. And I always, you know, and she ended up selling the last of her jewels to help feed children during the Dublin lockout Jim Larkin strike. Mm. Yeah, I was fascinated how much she had done in her work for Irish independence and human rights, even going to jail a few times, her house being ransacked. Um, could you tell us more about her Irish work, Irish resistance work? Um, well, she organized people who were evicted and helped feed them and organized with the, pre, the local priest, who of course was tremendously important to take care of their physical needs. And she had the idea to start a fish curing plant in Falkara. Um, and um, she was just always, you know, and she was, she stumped for home rule candidates, because for a while, it seemed as if Britain would pass a home rule allowing Ireland to rule itself. But mm -hmm. that did not come to happen. Yeah, it was a very bleak time. You described very vividly how the Irish were so disenfranchised and couldn't own land. And, and uh, you know, she did, uh, it was such an important time to help the Irish have greater human rights and freedoms. And food for the children. You know, she organized something called a patriotic children's treats because when Victoria came to Ireland, they rounded up like 2000 children um, to show that they were happy to see Victoria. So Maud, with a bunch of her friends and young women, as well as their partners, managed to feed 20 to 30,000 Dublin school children in what was called the patriotic children's treat. So they got oranges and buns and were made very happy. Amazing. When you did the research, were you surprised how much activism and how much work she had done to really further the causes she was passionate about? Um, well, it was like putting my toe in the water. You know, one thing led to another and then I was submerged. She had just done, she made it her life's work to help the Irish get political and economic power. Yeah, fascinating. And now, she also mm -hmm. wrote about it. She became, she was one of the first women journalists mm -hmm. and she published and was interviewed. She went on tour. Yeah. Maybe we could just mute everyone. If everyone could just mute uh, your microphone, we'll open it up again for questions a little later. Okay. Yeah, that's fascinating. Now, she did eventually marry. Can you tell us something about her choice of husband? Um, she, instead of marrying Yates, who proposed to her four times, she chose uh, a man named Major John McBride, who was an Irishman who'd fought in the Boer War against the British 
and was labeled as a hero of the Boer War. So she married an army man like her father had been. And um, they thought that they could do great things together for Ireland. And when they met, um, also they went on lecture tours in America to raise money for the amnesty associations. But mm. he said, it's kind of like a he said, she said thing. She said he proposed to her, but he wrote that she proposed to him. <laughs> in a, they both wrote that separately <laughs> in their memoirs. Yeah, and you do have some great uh, you know, notes back and forth from their family members. There was a lot of uh, thought that they shouldn't actually marry, that they weren't an ideal couple, which I found fascinating. Why did you find it fascinating, Lisa? Well, well, you know, you kind of, she did seem to have a lot of options in her life. And, you know, she chose this man. And, and, and then you write in the book that, you know, everyone was sort of against it. And it, the happiness didn't last for long, it sounds like. Uh -oh. <laughs> she, she was lonely from all her lecture tours, you know, all over the U.S. and I Ireland and England and France and she wrote her sister that she had met someone who she thought she could make a life with as a comrade but um you know it it didn't work out at all the only good thing that came out of it was their son Sean McBride um and one of and Maud's companion sent a wire to the Pope of Ireland when the boy was born saying that King of Ireland has been born because there are very high expectations of a child of Maud McBride, Maud Gunn and John McBride. And John le ended in a hero's death, right? Fighting for Ireland. Yes. Well, there was a rebellion in 1916 and he blundered into it and helped the the rebels, they thought this small group that they could hold off the British government and they took the post office in, in Dublin and he ended up being caught and executed. And this legend goes that he did not accept a blindfold before his execution by firing squad. Mm -hmm. Now his son did go on to great uh, political and uh human rights uh, activities. Can you tell us about his son, their son? Yeah, their son, but I found Maud was afraid that John McBride would steal her son away and take him to Ireland where he would be able to raise him because they weren't officially divorced mm -hmm. in either Catholic, Catholic France or Catholic Ireland. She brought Sean up in Paris uh, and he spoke English with a French accent all his life. Wow. But what he accomplished when his mother returned to Ireland and after his father had a hero's death, um, he became, he worked with the IRA as a teenager. And then um, he worked his way up to being chief of staff for the IRA. And he must have been very bright because he went and to law school without having gone to college. And then he defended all his old IRA buddies in court for human rights. And that work segued into his being a co-founder of Amnesty International, which is for human rights all over the world. And um, for his work with them, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, but unfortunately his mother had died by then. Uh -huh. She would have, you know, thought it was natural. Mm. Oh, that's quite a career. And now I know when you were doing the research, you found, began to find some letters and things that, that made you realize Maud was complex and maybe not as likable all the time. Can you, but you continued working on the book. Can you tell us about that? Uh, sure. Well, I'm Jewish and consider myself culturally Jewish and am proud to be so. So I was very dismayed when I discovered not only was she anti Semitic, she was a lifelong anti Semite. Even after World War II, she had nothing good to say about the Jews. So I was thinking maybe I did not want to write the book. Mm. And actually it was in Paris during that horrible heat wave. It was 108 degrees that I was reading her letter and thinking this just isn't gonna work. 
<coughs> and my friend who's in the audience now, Betsy was like, you have to wait till the heat goes down. <laughs> Think about it later. So I did, and I decided that she had much to recommend her while at the same time she was, to me, a vile anti-Semite. You know, she was brave for, she helped children and she helped political prisoners and she wanted to reform prisons. She had a lot of radical ideas. That's quite a career. I know, um, is, I guess we'll go ahead and begin to, would you want to say anything else before we open it to the audience for questions? Um, what I wanted to say particularly, and with a shout out to Leslie for doing this at the US Women China's Foundation is that Maud Gunn had a vision that right. before, during World War I, that it would be women who was responsible for uh, peace. She said, could the women who are after all our guardians of the race end the war? Um, it will be the men are destroying themselves and we are looking on. Will it be in our power to end this war before European civilization is swept away? Uh, and so she was thought that women you know, and US, I looked up how many women there are in the US and China, and there are 849 million of them. <laughs> so if they all spoke up for peace, as Maud uh, advocated, it would be amazing. That's a good note to end the interview on. Why don't we open it up for questions? And, and just remember, of course, to unmute if you want to ask a question. And we can, of course, I guess, use the hand thing, shall we? If you want to use the reaction where you raise um, your I'd, hand. I'd like to just jump in, Kim. Thank you for that quote. I think it is very inspirational. And thank you for writing such an excellent book. Um, just uh, following up on that, I think uh, one of the challenges for Asian American women and Chinese women in China is to speak up and to um, start creating their own narrative. And that's why I was so thrilled to be able to have this uh, celebration today, because I think not only did you give Maud back her voice, but you also had your voice in there too. So to the extent that we can as a foundation and as you know, women and men together give voice to women and uh, who they are, I think we'll all uh, really do much better together. I have a question. Sure. Um, well, first of all, Kim, very interesting, great talk. Thank you. And I'm looking so forward to reading the book. Um, but I was wondering, is Maud considered Irish or is she English? That's and a which great question. The Irish thought, think of her as an Irish patriot, but when you go into her ancestry, she was really... British. She was born in Tongham, England. She was christened. Um, her father was born in London. And she had, I think, one great grandparent who was Irish, but everyone else was British. So she was technically British, but she chose her country as being Ireland. And she ended up living the rest of her life there after 1916. And uh, uh, and um, she made it her home and her great grandchildren all lived there too. So it wasn't just for her. It was like, she started a line. And just do the Irish, um, is she, do they accept her as one of their own or? Yes, they so accepted her as a great patriot, but actually it was tricky because when she and John McBride split, he went around saying that she was just English and he ruined her reputation temporarily. Sorry, turning that off. My, my internet's not working. Oh. Kim, can you hear me? Who is this? Uh, Pat, Pat Keen, hi. Yes, hi. Um, the last remarks you made about uh, the women and, and world peace, and of course, Maud, for most of her life, was a, a physical force nationalist and very much in favor of violence. 
but I was reading not too long ago. I read your book, by the way. I, I got it in the mail uh, the day before yesterday, and I've read most of it and have enjoyed it and, and learned. I know a reasonable amount about more, but I've learned some things. And I like the personal touch, too. In any case, um, I was reading letters back and forth um, between her and John Quinn. And um, I was following up on that because of Yeats's refusal to write a, a war poem when Henry James and others and Quinn pressed him to and he you know, uh, didn't write a, a war, uh, a, 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 a poem in support of the allies. Instead, he wrote, I think it better than in times like these, a poet's mouth be silent. So I was reading the letters between Maud and John Quinn, and he was still very uh, much in favor of the war as late as 1917. She was very much opposed right from the beginning. Yeah. Oh, right from thought... the guns of August. This is ludicrous. This is nonsense. A slaughter I... in Europe. And then she worked in a hospital yeah. and increased that feeling. Yes, yeah, she yeah. nursed men uh, during World War One, and she was she sent in a letter to John Quinn. I don't know what we're patching them up for, and just sending them back to get murdered. You yeah. know, so her ideas about violence as necessary to achieve revolution, I think, shifted when she got older and after she nursed countless young men, and she became an admirer of Gandhi. So I like to think that she would have embraced peaceful means to achieve political goals. But I, there's, yeah. no, uh, there's no proof that she did, just the letter saying that she really was very upset when Gandhi was assassinated. Yeah. Uh, hello, this is Ann Tate in Toronto. Uh, I didn't want to interrupt you, Patrick. But uh, you're absolutely right about uh, Maud early on uh, favoring violence. And, and uh, Kim, perhaps you uh, remember that incident of her wanting to put bombs on the British troops. Yes. And it was, uh, I think, uh, uh, the beginning of the real um, conflict between her and Yates who was not for um, the guns and the bloodshed. And I think that Maud uh, and he had that strong difference of opinion, but later in, in uh, the war, she did turn uh, to help the soldiers. So there, there was a transition in her. Like most of us, she, <laughs> she changed as her life went on. Would you agree? I would. And I think uh, uh, you, you mentioned this, Kim, and, and others have too, but on their honeymoon, McBride and, and Maud went to Gibraltar because McBride had a plan to kill, assassinate Edward VII. I know. And, uh, and Maud, who isn't very forthcoming in, uh, in Servant of the Queen, but she's forthcoming there and says that she was in favor of the plan. And fortunately, maybe because of McBride's drinking, it, it never came together. It sort of fizzled, fortunately. Yeah, I mean, some elements of her life are just fantastic, you know. Yeah, yes. Oh, I'm going to have a honeymoon and assassinate the King of England. <laughs> it was and more it, exciting than Yeats's honeymoon, at least, <laughs> where he was haunted but, by her and thoughts of assault and was kind of psychologically uh, impotent in the early stages of their of the honeymoon with Georgie. Uh, they didn't do, have any, do, anybody to bomb. <laughs> Do you know that photograph of her and McBride and the baby, Sean? Yeah. The front of it has, is all sorts of oh. guns. <laughs> Gone, yeah, yeah, Lisa's got it in her book, if it, but I don't think it'll show very well. Ah, interesting. Wait, I used a lot of well-known photographs and some that were not as well-known, which was really fun. And uh, again, we have in the chat a discount for 15% off for the book or the ebook uh, at Or Books. And you can find the link there or you can obviously Google it. Um, I was just looking, yeah, there's some great pictures in here as well. Yeah, there's Lucien Millevoy, the hands. I thought he was a handsome Frenchman. Here's the know. handsome Frenchman. <laughs> With the perfect mustache. <laughs> Very good. Are there any other questions? I have a question. Sure. Yes. 
Kim, I think this is just absolutely wonderful and I'm absolutely fascinated and can't wait to read your book. Did you find in order to get all the source material, I, I'm interested in sort of the logistics of how you wrote a book about somebody who is from a different generation. And did you find that you could find that you could do your research almost all online or did you have any interesting trips to hidden libraries or hidden homes? Well, for some reason that I don't know, Emory has all her personal papers, Emory University in Atlanta. And wow. <laughs> um, the letters from Yates and two Yates are there. So I went there to look at them and I didn't trust some of my sources. So I went to the National Library of Ireland and verified that she wrote a letter to her friend, Esther Maynan, saying she was sorry she hadn't written earlier, but she was so devastated by the news of Gandhi's death. Um, but actually the French stuff was mostly online. And I found a couple of French librarians, you know, who helped me sift through thousands and thousands of documents and correctly find and search for her name, you know, uh, and in answer again to Betsy's question about whether was she Irish or English in, in the French newspapers and the American newspapers, she said she was Irish. Her father was Irish and proud of it, but he was not. <laughs> Great sleuthing. Yeah. There also, you met with her grandchildren in Ireland, didn't you? Her great grandchildren. Great -grandchildren. Her grandchildren have all, have died. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they they seem really remarkable women. The the women that I met. Since you're mentioning those, one thing that uh, sort of troubled me. I, I can't remember which one you were talking to, Kim, uh, but she was saying, "Oh, don't listen to anything." Uh, or she was telling her, "Don't listen to anything Yates has to say about Madame, you know, whatever." But she also said, uh, uh, "Whichever niece or nephew, whatever the heck she was, I don't remember." Um, that Yates might have been the father of his salt, which is absolute nonsense, of course. Oh, she uh, said it was nonsense. After oh, she knew it was, yeah, her. okay. Yeah. It was Lara Stewart. She just said she thought he would have been a much better, you know, great-grandparent than um, Lucien Milvois. I mean, Lucien Milvois didn't help financially his daughter at all, and his suggestion to his daughter at, for an occupation was to be a mistress. <laughs> <laughs> uh, perhaps, Kim, you could comment on the, um, uh, the boffin on the coffin, let's call it, uh, the birth of Isolde uh, in the attempt to resurrect the soul of, of the child that had died. Maud Gunn uh, and Lucien, when her baby died of meningitis and he was a year and a half old. She was completely grief stricken and, and spent, I think, the equivalent to 60,000 pounds to build a tomb and mausoleum for him. And then she believed in all the supernatural uh, ideas that were the rage at the time. Uh, and she listened to a friend of Yates, and he said he thought that the spirit of a child could be reincarnated in a new child's body if it was the same parents and if it was in a special place. So she chose um, Ernest's tomb and persuaded Lucien Millevoix to make love to her there. And uh, either that occasion or on others, she became pregnant with Isolt. Love among the tombstones. Yeah, the friend was uh, George Russell. He knew nothing about, uh, you know, the personal affairs of, of Maud, but she did talk to him and uh, he suggested that within a family you could, you know, miraculously uh, a child would be born uh, if it was in the same family, taking the place really of the dead one, A.E. or George Russell. Yeah, I have to point out that they all took hash in the, in the hopes of enhancing their visions of Irish mythic <laughs> heroes and heroines. So this may have helped her. Yeah, yeah. You know, she called it the dream drug that Yates sent her. It's, it's astonishing that she kept the truth from him for so long. I mean, they met in 89. 
she didn't really confide in him, I think until like 97 or something like eight years passed before she divulged all this love among the tombstones is so the whole deal, the whole relationship with Melville. I guess she wanted to keep Yates. She didn't love him, um, but she respected she him and admired him and wanted to keep that relationship. So she, how she could keep quiet about it for all those years is astonishing. Well, it's Victorian England and, you know, Irish Catholic. True. You know, was the Irish Catholic ascendancy in Dublin. I mean, all the morals of her time were that you should not have a child out of wedlock. And, um, you know, I think, and, and Yates kind of freaked out when she told him, at least that's my interpretation. And let's face it, he never told her anything about Olivia Shakespeare or about Mabel Dickinson, you know? Um, so there you go. Right. And they never discussed money, even though he was a poor poet and she was- That's an amazing. Incredibly yeah. rich heiress. I think if they had been able to discuss money, who knows, they might've uh, married. Yeah, my friend in Ireland who uh, read the book, uh, he was saying he had no idea she was so wealthy. That was not at least I know. known. I remember when she showed up at, uh, at Yates's place the first time in, in 89, she kept the hansom cab waiting for hours while she was in there and uh, the Yates's sisters were yes, distressed. They were <laughs> yeah, they were all <laughs> there wasn't on much budget. money in the house, yeah. They yeah. were all on a budget. There were four children with an artist father who never made a dime and was living off of his in-laws. Yeah. So when Maud showed up for a visit and left the handsome cab waiting, uh, one of his sisters remarked that she was in her slippers. She wasn't even wearing proper shoes. So they were uh, taken aback. Yeah, they're very wary of her. Lady Gregory was too, though. She was very kind to Maud. Somebody asked about money before, and, and Lady Gregory did help her with some legal arrangements, at the, I think, during the, uh, during the separation and the rest Lady of it. Lady Gregory's main contribution to Maud Gunn's life was to tell her that she should not get married in Paris unless she got married in the English embassy or her husband would control her fortune. Right, so great advice, yeah. A big deal. She also said something that stuck in my mind when I was reading Yeats's poem, um, A Bronze Head, uh, you know, the sculpture of Maud in the Municipal Gallery. When Lady Gregory finally met her, Yeats had been going on at a great rate, of course, about how beautiful she was and et cetera. And the first feeling that Lady Gregory got was she felt like she was looking at a death's head, which was very strange. I mean, she was wary. She was protective of Yeats. She was wary of this beauty coming sick. out of it. Death's head, strange. She'd been sick, I, so maybe she oh, looked like so she go, Ah, ah. Had gone, Maud Gunn was sick. I see, that's, yeah, that, that makes a difference, yeah. Uh, thank you. Great, are there any other questions? If not, we will thank you all for coming and we, sh we want to, I'd put it in chat, but Kim is speaking next Tuesday, March 30th at seven o'clock. The Irish rep is having an event with Kim and Joe Hassett, who's written a book on Yeats. So it's going to be with some actors reading Yeats poems and Kim and Joe talking about their expertise in their books. So another great event, especially if you're keen to hear uh, Yeats and Maud compared and discussed together with some great actors reading the poems. So thank you all for coming. Thank, Thank you, you, Kim. Always. Wonderful. Thank I so enjoyed your book. Now everyone Leslie can see and Lisa for hosting me. Thank and you everyone for coming. Liz, it's great to see you. Great to see you too. <laughs> bye, bye bye. See you and next bye. time. Bye. bye. Thank you, Kim. And it was very, very interesting. Good. See you all soon again. Thanks for coming. And Leslie, you're going to give me your email. It's Anne in Toronto about that uh, film. It is in the chat, but do you want to? It's uh, Leslie at CUSWF.org. At CUSWF.org, China US Women's Foundation.org. F.org. Org. F dot org. Yeah. Leslie, uh, may I say it back to you, Leslie, L E S L I E, mm -hmm. at CUSWF dot org exactly right 
I am going to send you a Vimeo Good. of the film. Look which, forward to it. Uh, I, and I look forward to your reactions. And I think we can use it to uh, help the aims of your foundation. I look forward to receiving it. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.